Hello, BookTube. The snowstorm here in Boston has undergone bombogenesis. <laughs> so, so it's whiteout conditions. The snow is flying down. My teenage boys are sleeping in preparation for tonight's Titanic drinking because neither snow nor sleep nor freezing rain stops that. Uh, and the dogs are sound asleep and the Christian Science Monitor newsroom is closed except for essential personnel, which apparently does not include book reviewers. <laughs> So, and I'm largely caught up on my writing work, which means I'm sort of su I'm sort of sitting here. <laughs> so, I'm afraid you're stuck with me. I may make a few videos today, <laughs> uh, but the first one I want to do is a surprise, a, a pleasant surprise. It's a gigantic book haul uh, because apparently the, the mail came anyway, even though Bombo Genesis has happened. So I thought we'd go through these. Let's let's see what we have here. Uh, first one has a pleasing amount of heft to it. <laughs> Uh, so it might be something big. Be nice. Oh, it is something big. Oh my. Oh my. Okay. This is uh, this is the Witchwood Crown, the new doorstop by Tad Williams. Uh, the last king of Austin Ard is the uh, is the name of it. And it's uh, it's a June release from Daw. How nice that to get to get fantasy even from. Uh, a writer who can't write his way out of a wet paper bag like Tad Williams. <laughs> uh, still, it, that's just wonderful. Uh, the Danger, the Dragonbone Chair, the first volume in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, was published in hardcover in October 1988. Remember it well. <laughs> it was like a tooth canal. Uh, launching the series that was to become one of the seminal works of modern epic fantasy. Many of today's top-selling fantasy authors, from Patrick Rothfuss to George R. R. Martin to Christopher Paolini, credit Tad Williams with being an inspiration for their own series. I would like it if someone could show me proof of George Martin saying that Tad Williams was an inspiration for anything he ever wrote. Uh, the other two I don't doubt. <laughs> but uh, anyway... Uh, Okay, well, it's, it's great to get a gigantic uh, fantasy novel, first thing. That's wonderful. Uh, I wish I could be more enthusiastic about it, but the, there's just no literary merit to the series at all. It's, it's just lazy, awful, cliche, choked writing. Uh, and also boring. This is an author who can go 200 pages of prose twiddling his thumbs. Uh, but may, maybe this will be different. <laughs> so, in the meantime, what have we got here? Oh, all right. This is a May release. This is uh, Sunrise by Sin by Philip Caputo, who did A Rumor of War. That's uh, Sunrise by Sin. Uh, Philip Caputo is one of the few absolutely essential writers at work today, says Robert Olin Butler. <laughs> Which means he ought to get out more. <laughs> Uh, the Mexican village of San Patricio is being menaced by a bizarre cultist drug cartel infamous for its brutality. As the townspeople try to defend themselves by forming a vigilante group, the Mexican army and police have their own ways of fighting back. Into this volatile mix of forces for good and evil steps an unlikely broker for peace, Timothy Reardon, an American missionary priest who must decide whether to betray his vows to stop the unspeakable violence and help the people he has pledged to protect. Huh. Okay, some rise by sin. Sounds ambitious. Uh, Philip Caputo, who is, is not one of the essential writers working today. He's resolutely third rate, but uh, you never know. <laughs> uh, so let's do... Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's another olive book, I think. <laughs> well, it's, this is, these are kicks in the pants here, these, these last few, for me to maybe make a package and send it her way. <laughs> this is Russia, The Story of War, by Gregory Carlton. Uh, <laughs> who those dreamy people are on the cover. Is that supposed to be... Who is that on the cover? I know this painting. I, I, who, I the, the problem with the, with the advanced copy is that I pro it probably won't tell me. It's a famous painting of... Uh, oh, crap. It doesn't tell me. Well, I, I think it's Peter the Great, but I, 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 it could be somebody else. Uh, uh, let's see here. No stranger... No nation is a stranger to war, but for Russians, war is a central part of who they are. Their motherland has been the battlefield where some of the largest armies have clashed and the most savage battles have been fought, the highest death tolls paid. Having prevailed over Mongol hordes and vanquished Napoleon and Hitler, 
Many Russians believe no other nation has sacrificed so much for the world. Uh, in Russia, the story of war, Gregory Carlton explores how this belief has produced a myth of exceptionalism that pervades Russian culture and politics and has helped forge a national identity rooted in war. Well, that sounds interesting. Huh. And this, this guy is a professor of Russian studies at Tufts University. So, all right. Uh, it's an odd size, though. I mean, is the hardcover going to be this small? It's, it's a, it's... I mean, if we're talking, if we're talking Mongol hordes and uh, an all-pervading sense of international exceptionalism, don't you want more than uh, two hundred and ninety-five pages? I, wouldn't that be just Napoleon? <laughs> Who knows? Here, let's let's move on here. Uh, okay, uh, I did not request this, but that's all right. This comes out in June. This is uh, Al Capone's Beer Wars. The Complete History of Organized Crime in Chicago During the Prohibition. Hmm. A subject on which I know nothing, except for the, uh, this is not going to have, the advanced copy is not going to have an index. Uh, but I, uh, some of you will be able to tell, <laughs> I'm sure that some of you will be able to predict, the one aspect of Al Capone's Prohibition Beer Wars uh, that I know really well, that I know in fact backwards and forwards. And, uh, and you'd be right, it's Joe Kennedy. <laughs> JFK's father, who is, was not a stranger to the Prohibition era. <laughs> uh, but I, I'll have to wait for the finished copy to see if he's in here, unless, of course, I read it first. <laughs> I'll be too busy with Tad Williams. <laughs> oh, all right, okay. This is a, a, another thing I did not request, uh, but great, absolutely, absolutely great. This comes out in a week. This is Most Dangerous Place by James Grappando. It's a tropical island viewed through a curtain. That's kind of a nice cover design. Uh, uh, it's a it's a Jack Switek novel. Who's, uh, that's his, his lead He-Man character. Uh, according to the FBI, the most dangerous place for a woman between the ages of 20 and 30 is in a relationship with a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the President of the United States. Uh, those statistics become all too personal when Jack Switek takes on a new client from his past. It begins at the airport, where Jack is waiting to meet his old high school buddy Keith Ingraham, a high-powered banker based in Hong Kong, coming to Miami for his young daughter's surgery. But their long-awaited reunion is abruptly derailed when the police arrest Keith's wife. She is accused of conspiring to kill the man who raped her in college. Jack quickly agrees to represent her, but soon discovers that to see justice done, he must separate truth from lies, an undertaking that proves more complicated than the seasoned attorney expects. Okay. All right. I'm sensing a pattern here. <laughs> you've got, got Philip Caputo, you've got Tad Williams, and now you've got James Grappando. These are all resolutely third-rate writers. Good, well-intentioned, certainly popular with their audience, but... Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's keep going and try for a home run. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, all right, this is... Uh, this is a book on booktube here that got a lot of play uh max well done books who seems to have gone away uh loved a man called Uve. <laughs> this is bear town by the same author frederick backman uh with i, I don't know if you can see the cover is is kind of good you've got kids playing hockey and in the background there's a bear <laughs> i actually know people who live in parts of america where that is not a fantasy <laughs> uh so let's see here it's been a long time since the residents of Bear Town. It's actually called Bear Town. That's asking for trouble. Have <laughs> uh, felt like winners. That could change this year if the teenage boys who make up the junior hockey ice team can win the national championship. They have their heads, the hands, and the hearts to do it. But it's what happens off the ice that will change this town forever. Oh my God! So it's a hockey novel. There's a kind of daring in that, isn't there? Uh, and it's big too. Uh, Okay, okay, great. Uh, I I uh, was not impressed by a man called Uv. I uh, I thought it was boring, uh, but but I think a lot of Nordic fiction is boring. So so maybe I need an attitude adjustment. <laughs> maybe I need to undergo a little bombogenesis of my own. <laughs> I will certainly read this one with wide open eyes. So so that'll solve that problem. Uh, Bear town. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's next here? We we'll got a little pile. Don't want to disturb the Basset Hound. 
Okay, this is The Murder of Willie Lincoln by Bert Solomon. And there's Willie right there. <laughs> uh, what on earth? Washington City, 1862. The United States lies in tatters, and the Civil War seems without end. Despite Abraham Lincoln's determination to keep his beloved country united, Lincoln's soul is tested when tragedy strikes the White House. Willie, Lincoln's 11-year-old son and the shining light in the president's life, dies of typhoid fever, or so the doctors say. Then a message arrives suggesting that murder, not illness, caused Willie's death. Lincoln asks John Hay, oh my god, you're kidding me. John Hay is going to be the hero, the action hero? <laughs> His trusted aide to investigate. Hay, a boxer and a poet. Oh, he was not much of either, for Pete's sake. <laughs> is an adventurous, irreverent, skeptical, even cynical young man who is as close to Lincoln as his son. No, that's not Willie Lincoln. That's Tad Lincoln. Right? <laughs> I'm getting Lincoln boys mixed up. Uh, the more hay on earth, the more daunting his task seems. Suspicions of a secessionist conspiracy within the executive mansion itself. A threat to Lincoln's surviving sons. An extortion attempt against the president's hell cat of a wife. <laughs> As the war rages on, J John Hay chases the truth of Willie's murder through the loftiest and lowest corners of Washington City. As he closes in, he discovers just how far Lincoln's enemies go will go to keep him silent. I cannot believe it. This author is going to make John Hay an action hero. <laughs> I know most of you won't know who he is, but if you Google him, I doubt you'll see the lineaments of an action hero. <laughs> Oh my! He's also the subject of a great biography a few years ago. Just a great biography. I'll, I'll, I will try to remember to leave all the info down below. I really will. I do. It's not a taunt. I just forget. Uh, but who is Bert Solomon when he's at home? Oh, he seems happy. Nice. That's a nice author photo. No, none of the uh, the the when you've got the the early thirties brooding hipster from Brooklyn who's just finished with his artisanal kale coffee and his author photo is like you know I'm just too profound for photography to even work on me I'm amazed that I come off on camera this guy does not make me want to punch him in the face <laughs> uh, he's a contributing editor for the Atlantic a national journal he's covered the White House on all aspects of Washington life in 1991 he won the Gerald R. Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency He's also the author of the claim, Where They Ain't, A History of Baseball in the 1890s. And he lives inside the Beltway. He's not just, he's not just talking the talk. Good Lord. <laughs> I, uh, I lived inside the Beltway myself for just a small bit of time, and it's not for pussies. <laughs> it's, it's, not for, it's not for wimps. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> All right, let's, uh, let's go on here. We've still got plenty of books to go. And who knows if I don't get a second shipment today. I might... Got nothing else to do. <laughs> if the mail comes through, I'm all for it. Oh. Okay. Boy, this is a two-fisted aura to the books today. Uh, this is this is great. This is G-Man by Stephen Hunter. Look at that cover. <laughs> this is a Bob Lee Swagger novel, uh, and he's. Well, well, let's 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 find out together, shall we? I don't know if any of you have read Bob Lee Swagger novels, but they are pretty much the epitome of uh, a certain testosterone dunked type of airport thriller. Uh, in G-Man, 1934 was a pivotal year in the ongoing battle between the FBI and America's most famous outlaws. It was a year of giant personalities and huge shootouts, and it marked the deaths of John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, and Pretty Boy Floyd. All in one year, I hadn't thought of that. It's true though, isn't it? They all died that year, among others. But that year, FBI agent Sam Cowley's priority was to nab the most dangerous gangster this country has ever produced, a man so violent that he scared Al Capone and was booted from the Chicago mob, Babyface Nelson. To stop him, Cowley recruited the most talented gunman of the time, Charles Swagger. Oh, God, so the whole family has been two-fisted? <laughs> When Bob Lee Swagger finally sells the land he owned in Arkansas, the developers begin to tear down the old homestead and uncover a steel case which contains a batch of 1934 memorabilia, all belonging to Charles Swagger. Bob never knew his grandfather Charles, so who died before he was born, and his father Earl refuses to mention him. Fascinated by this new information, Bob is driven to find out what happened to his grandfather and why his own father, whom he worshipped, 
never spoke of Charles. But as he investigates further, Bob learns that someone is following him. I knew it. I can't. <laughs> someone with his own obsession for finding out Charles Swagger left behind <laughs> a battered tin dispatch box. Straight out of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> okay, so this is this is uh, Stephen Hunter. When, is, when does this come out? Do we have a date on this thing? Is it's one of these one of these uh, uh, bound galleys? So uh, May it comes out in May, and uh, it's it's that's that's a kind of inventive approach to an ongoing series, right? If you've got an ongoing series, you've got one person, this one character having one incredible adventure after another, over and over again. Sometimes in the space between bed and the coffee shop, uh, it starts to get it starts to cra strain credulity. So creating a historical thriller in the past, I imagine the bulk of this book will be devoted to it. That's a, that's a kind of a, a clever variation on theme. Uh, not quite as clever as simply killing Bob Lee Swagger, but <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to plant a plastique bomb under the car of the goose that laid the golden egg. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Excellent. Uh, this is uh, Sea Power by Admiral James Stavridis. 